Humility, the path unto rest, by St. Gregory of Sinai and Elder Ephraim. Those who say or do anything without humility are like people who build in winter or without bricks and mortar. Very few acquire humility and know it through experience. And those who try to talk about it are like people measuring a bottomless pit. And I, who in my blindness have formed a faint image of this great light, am rash enough to say this about it. True humility does not consist in speaking humbly or in looking humble. The humble person does not have to force himself to think humbly, nor does he keep finding fault with himself. Such conduct may provide us with an occasion for humility or constitute its outward form, but humility itself is a grace and a divine gift. The Holy Fathers teach that there are two kinds of humility, to regard oneself as lower than everyone else and to ascribe all one's achievement to God. The first is the beginning, the second the consummation. Those who seek humility should bear in mind the three following things, that they are the worst of sinners, that they are the most despicable of all creatures, since their state is an unnatural one, and that they are even more pitiable than the demons, since they are slaves to the demons. You will also profit if you say this to yourself, how do I know what or how many other people's sins are, or whether they are greater than or equal to my own? In our ignorance, you and I, my soul, are worse than all men. We are dust and ashes under their feet. How can I not regard myself as more despicable than all other creatures? For they act in accordance with the nature they have been given, while I, owing to my innumerable sins, am in a state contrary to nature. Truly animals are more pure than I, a sinner that I am. On account of this, I am the lowest of all, since even before my death I have made my body in hell. Who is not fully aware that the, demons, that the person who sins is worse than the demons, since he is their thrall and their slave, even in this life, sharing their murk-mantled pr prison? If I am mastered by the demons, I must be inferior to them. Therefore my lot will be with them in the abyss of hell, pitiful that I am. You on earth, who even before your death dwell in that abyss, how do you dare delude yourself, calling yourself righteous, when through the evil you have done, you have defiled yourself and made yourself a sinner and a demon? Woe to your self-deception and your delusion, squalid cure that you are, consigned to the fire and darkness for these offenses. We are led and guided towards God-given humility by seven different qualities each of which generates and complements the others. Silence, humbleness in thought, in speech, in appearance, self-reproach, contrition, and looking on oneself as the least of men. Silence consciously espoused gives birth to humbleness in thought. Humbleness in thought produces three further modes of humility, namely humbleness in speech, bearing oneself in a simple and humble way, and constant self belittlement These three modes give birth to contrition. This arises within us when God allows us to suffer temptations, when, that is, we are disciplined by providence and humbled by the demons. Contrition readily induces the soul to feel the lowest and the least of all and the servant of all. Contrition and looking on oneself as the least of all bring about the perfect humility that is the gift of God, a power rightly regarded as the perfection of all the virtues. It is a state in which one ascribes all one's achievements to God. Thus, the first factor leading to humility is silence, from which humbleness of thought is born. This gives birth to the three further modes of humility. These three generate the single quality of contrition. The quality of contrition gives birth to the seventh mode, the primal humility of regarding oneself as the least of men, which is also called providential humility. Providential humility confers the true and God-given humility that is perfect and indescribable. Primal humility comes thus. When you are abandoned, overcome, enslaved, and dominated by every passion, distractive thought, and evil spirit, you can find no help in doing good works, or in God, or in anything at all, so that you are ready to fall into despair when you are humbled in everything, are filled with contrition, and regard yourself as the lowest and least of all things, the slave of all and worse, even than the demons, since you are dominated and vanquished by them. 
This is providential humility. Once acquired through it, God bestows the ultimate humility. This is a divine power that activates and accomplishes all things. With its aid, a man always sees himself as an instrument of divine power, and through it, he accomplishes the miraculous works of God. Of Elder Ephraim of Arizona, God allows temptations so that they might rouse us to remember him. When we call upon him, he acts as though he does not hear us so that we multiply our supplications and cry out his holy name in fear of the various passions. Then, through the pain of the entreaties, our heart is sanctified, and through experience we learn the weakness of our lame nature. And thus we realize and practice that without God's help we are not able to do anything. This deep experience is acquired with the blood of the heart and remains indelible. It becomes a foundation for the remainder of one's life. The grace of God leaves and comes again, but experience never leaves because it has been branded within the heart. No matter how much Satan praises the heart, it points to what is indelibly written within its depths, that without God it is impossible to do anything. If there were no temptations, pride and other passions would have turned us into other Lucifers. But our good Father God allows afflictions to come upon us so that we may be guarded by humility, which will lighten the burden of our sins. When we are still in our youth, we must be tempted, for youth is easily derailed. In time, the war will cease and the desired peace will come. Just with just have courage and patience. Do not despair, no matter how much the passions may fight you. God loves one who is fought against and fights back. Be brave and pray also for me, the indolent, the unclean, the unworthy, the abomination. Be attentive to your thoughts. Your attention should mainly be turned to gathering humble thoughts. For humility saves man, and it is the chief aim of all spiritual pursuits. To see whether you have made spiritual progress in monasticism, search yourselves. And if you discover humility within yourselves, then you have made spiritual progress in proportion to the amount of humility you have. If instead of humility we see pride and egotism and their consequences, then we need to grieve and weep and mourn for our miserable condition, that the Lord may have compassion on us. Let us flee far away from egotism. It emits an unbearable stench, and miserable is the person who possesses this as his wealth. <clears throat> Such a person will never find peace not only because of the annoyance of the passions lurking in him, but also because he is far away from true humility. Rest for the soul is also granted to man through humility and meekness. This is what the Lord says to us. Learn from me, for I am meek and lonely in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For this reason, my dearly beloved children, let us love with all our soul and the humility of our Christ together with his meekness, and then indeed we shall find just as he said, manifold repose for our souls. It is not easy to acquire humility. Much labor and time are needed. To put egotism to death requires that we sacrifice ourselves, let us trample our ego underfoot, and embrace perfect self-denial. You, my child, should look only at yourself. You lack humility. Your pride and obstinacy are causing those thoughts which you wrote about. If you humble yourself, if you blame yourself in all temptations and believe that you suffer them because of your passions and that the elder and the brothers are not in fault, then immediately you will sense relief from those thoughts and your wounds will heal. If you expect to be healed by any other means, namely that the elder or the brothers change, your labor, you labor in vain. Evil requires eradication from the root, and its root is pride, egotism, obstinacy, the will, anger, etc. All these are healed with one medicine. By casting the burden of the error and the temptation on yourself, always say, it is my fault, I am the cause, because of my passions I suffer, and cause the cause of my evils is no one else but me, the thrice wretched one. Yes, my child, this is the highest truth. The true reality, walk in accordance with what I advise, walk along these guidelines, and you will truly find the health and the cure of your soul. Since we have pride, whether apparent or hidden without our realizing it, God desiring to pure us, purify us from this striking condition raises a storm in order to cast out all the dregs. 
which have accumulated mainly in a time of spiritual negligence. All kinds of rubbish and refuse are thrown into the sea, especially in the harbor, and if there were no storms, the sea would become a source of pestilence. But the fact that the sea is pure and wholesome is due to the occasional storms. Spiritually, the same thing happens with our soul, with the sea of our soul. Refuse, refuse accumulates little by little from our various passions and careless deeds, and the devil throws in his own trash too. We do not see how much refuse has accumulated. God knows, however, and since he wants to purify us, he st stirs up storms in proportion to the accum accumulation of refuse, and thus he purifies the sea of our soul. Sometimes after we pass through a temptation with patience, we see that our soul is calmed, joyful, and light as air. On our part, we must be careful not to accumulate refuse so that storms of corresponding magnitude do not become necessary. Storms are stirred up also in saints, but those are of another nature. They have another purpose. Sometimes a trial helps them become more holy, or it is for their greater glory, or it is so that they may glorify God more, or that, uh, or it has to do with the storms raised against orthodoxy, etc. So to it, it is, my child, that you have much humility, obedience to the advice of your elder, love for all, and that you never trust your thoughts, but follow faithfully the suggestions of your elder. Never become overconfident in yourselves. Never accept the thought that you are good and virtuous. Reproach yourselves, accuse yourselves inwardly in order to slay your ego, which is the wall that blocks the Son of Righteousness, Christ, so that his rays do not reach us to illumine our noose with the knowledge of God and of self. Love, humility, and everything. For our Jesus showed the example for us. When, when he girded himself with a towel and washed the feet of his disciples and said, Do you know what I have done to you? That is, just as I humbled myself by washing your feet, you too should humble yourselves to one another. Through humility, contact with the vine occurs sooner. For our Christ says, Learn from me, for I am meek and lowly, in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Rest for the soul is the truest sign of a healthy soul. Humble yourselves, degrade yourselves, abase yourselves, that the peace of God may come into your souls. Do not justify yourselves when the elder reproves you for one of your faults, but say, Bless. Let us love the humble dis disposition, my child. And if the Lord pities our nakedness and sends us some ability to pray and clothe our soul with some divine garment, we must be cautious lest we soil it out of carelessness, that is, through pride, criticism, negligence, disobedience, etc. But let us make a greater effort to whiten it through good works, especially through humble-mindedness and self-reproach. God is pleased more with these than with great works done with vainglory. Always have perfect obedience. Obedience is the offspring of humility, whereas backtalk, quarrels, and disobedience are the offspring of pride, which a monk must hate as the curses, as the causes of his own soul's defilement. The whole essence of the matter, my child, is this. You are being attacked by a spirit of pride along with her sisters, vainglory, and arrogance, along with their helpers, filthy and blasphemous thoughts. Know, my child, that the spirit of pride is difficult to overcome. The spirit of vainglory is many-headed and thorny. No matter how you change your thoughts or your way of life, you will find it in front of you like a thorn. And if this is how things are, what can we do? We should employ every means, whether mental or material, that leads us towards humility. Above all, we have to coerce our mind to think humbly and leave it to divine providence to arrange the deliverance from our reduction of this passion. On our part, we should preserve with a, with a fighting spirit, and God, in proportion to our struggle, will intervene as a succor and helper. About the dreadful passion of vainglory, St. John of the Latter says, Vainglory till the tomb. That is, until we die, we will be attacked by vainglory, with the difference that it will be weakened by the war against it and by long experience of its falsehood. Weep before God so that he grants you a spirit of humility, for only through this will you advance towards higher things, towards the love of God. 
Spiritual progress is nothing but the acquisition of humble-mindedness. Jesus, even though he is God, humbled himself so much, and we who are lowly by nature exalt ourselves and fluff out the feathers of vainglory like a peacock. However, when he throws us into some temptation and we, and we peacocks see the ugliness of our feet, that is, the rotten condition of our soul, then we re- recognize what we, the race of Adam, are by nature, and that our pride is not humbled except by slaps and falls, tears and mourning bring Tears and mourning bring much humility. Therefore, ask patiently from the giver of good things. Pray, do not overlook me, the prodigal one, O thou who wast born of a virgin. Do not overlook my tears, O joy of the angels, but receive me in repentance and save me. I pray that Jesus, the humble of heart, may give you his heart so that you may experience his humility. Humility is a wonderful virtue which makes fragrant the one who has it. He who has humility also has obedience, love, patience, and every virtue. When we get angry or become enraged or criticize or do not obey, it is evident that we have a corresponding amount of pride and egotism. The more we progress in humility, the more the evil offspring of egotism will retreat. My children, let us humble ourselves for the Lord who humbled himself for us. The Lord showed us such humility, even to the point of crucifixion. We so should, shouldn't we, who are lowly by nature, bow our head to our own brother? Do we expect always to get our own way? If we want Jesus to dwell within our heart, let us love and humble ourselves like Christ. Let us not grieve him any more with egotistic manifestations. Let us not crucify him again with expressions and conduct lacking brotherly love. No more bitterness in the holy heart of our most sweet Christ. I entreat our Panagia very much that she grant me humility in all things, for it is a fundamental virtue, and without it the grace of the All-Holy Spirit does not validate any of our work. When the Archbishop of Alexandria, Theophilos, visited the fathers of Mount Nitria, he asked the elder of the mountain, What have you found, Father, more than us in this way of Assisis? And the Venerable One replied, To reproach myself at all times. Truly, replied Theophilos, There is no shorter road to God than this. Didn't Lucifer and Adam fall away from God through pride and rebellion? Wasn't Adam saved by the humility of the Theotokos? Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And of the Son of God, who was born of her without change, who taught and practiced extreme humility, he also said, Learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls." Whenever a person looks upon himself with humble thoughts and self-reproach, he will see in his soul a sweet repose, peace, consolation, relief, and hope. While on the contrary, what shows him his pride of soul is restlessness, agitation, wrath, boasting, haughty tendencies, and so on. Ah, how effortless the road of humility is. Even without laboring ascetically or enduring illness, a person with humility and self-reproach along with thanksgiving to God is able to reach spiritual heights and feel the gift of sonship. While on the contrary, toiling ascetically without realizing one's own infirmity and weakness and wretchedness is a struggle without prizes, sweat without wages, a road without hope. What a misfortune to struggle without profit. Our holy God lets temptations come upon those who love him in order to teach them the art of war. The grace of God withdraws and then clouds of temptations rise and one reaches the point of saying, See, God has abandoned me. Then he has myriads of thoughts, strangulation of soul and darkness and lapses everywhere. Holy wisdom, our holy God, causes all these and we learn that that only God is able to save us and that without God all our own works are rubbish and chaff which all scatter with the slightest wind of temptation, and it becomes apparent that we are rusty things, feeble and unable to face any temptation whatsoever without the aid of our holy God's grace. Through such things, the grace of divine providence teaches us the lesson of self-knowledge, that is, of true, cognizant, solid, bedrock humility, for without it, it is impossible to build a spiritual house He abandons us to the point of despair so that we are compelled to cry out to him mournfully and lamentably so that our mouth and heart may be sanctified. 
Temptations therefore bring about all these things. Indeed, let us pray that God will protect us from temptations, but when they come, we must pass through them with patience and wisdom to profit from them. Therefore, have patience in all things and thus save yourself. My child, as a rule, you should have continual self-reproach in every controversy. Do a prostration first, thus, thus you receive the crown first, and you cause your brothers to repent. At all times, reflect on the Lord who humbled himself so that your soul is ready to endure every kind of humiliation for his love. That which plays the most important role in the spiritual struggle is for a person to learn to humble himself, reproach himself, and justify his neighbor. Whoever has learned this philosophy is surely greater and already the most sweet fruit of freedom from passions. Otherwise, he will drag his passions along with him to his great and constant grief. My child, reproach yourself constantly. Do not consider yourself to be right whenever you hear something bad being said about you. Say, my brothers are right. This is how I am. I deserve even more slander because of my sins. Always consider yourself lower than everyone and refrain from giving orders as one having authority. In short, humility is everything. Always reckon yourself as very sinful and polluted, so that Jesus Christ may have sympathy for you and send you mercy and forgiveness of your many sins. Have obedience to all the brethren. Become last of all and the, the lowest if you want your passions and weaknesses to depart from you. Never justify yourself, neither in word nor in thought, but always condemn yourself as the one being at fault and deserving many blows.